welcome to video streaming, content costs and conversion, or as I prefer it, video streaming matters. Um, one thing that's really clear is that the road ahead to streaming is going one way. It's a bit like getting here this morning. Um, and it's not a matter of if we're moving to video streaming, it's a matter of how and when. And so it's prompted some major consolidation across the major global uh, media companies. It's prompted spending of billions of dollars by the tech giants on content to support the streaming plans. Um, and in, here in Asia, we're seeing projections for growth. Um, media Part of Asia projects, projects that the online video revenue is going to grow from 21 billion this year to 48 billion dollars in 2023. And that's going to be matched by the content spending of the online video players. They're going to increase from $16 billion this year to $31 billion in 2023. Now, underlying that is a lot of competition and changes in the landscape. Um, latest estimates, 224 streaming services across the Asia region, more than 20 in each of Thailand and Taiwan and India. So we've assembled an expert panel today from global giants um, like Netflix and Twitter and Facebook and the global leaders in, in um, uh, cable television networks, Fox, to come and discuss some of these issues. So let me just introduce the panel. Saurabh Doshi from uh, Facebook, Rohit De Silva from uh, Fox Networks Group, uh, Tony Zabakowski from Netflix, and Ryan Moore from uh, Twitter. So you can just join me in welcoming the panel. So one of the things I thought we'd start by discussing is um, audience or subscribers. Um, how do you actually decide who you're targeting with your audiences and how are you using your streaming services? In some cases, that's your main focus, but how are you using video streaming to target and engage those audiences? So I thought I'd ask the first question towards Tony since Netflix is at least the most famous of the streaming services at this point in time. First of all, uh, well done in pronouncing well my name. <laughs> That's not easy. <laughs> I was practicing. Um, so we, we have overall you know, 130 uh, million members all around the world. And what we see being very encouraging is the fact that we are getting more and more members uh, outside of the US. Uh, we have more than 72 uh, million members uh, outside of the US as, uh, as well. Um, the, if you look at our audience, it's pretty diversified. Uh, we have different kind of content. We have drama and movies and, uh, and, and documentaries. But something that is important to understand is uh, Netflix is hyper-personalized. So basically, your Netflix would be very different from my Netflix because we do have different tastes. So even though the audience is pretty, uh, it's pretty global, uh, we target every single one of us uh, given you know, your, uh, your behavior on how you watch content. So I mean, how do you actually, once you've got your audience through the, the initial target, how are you actually keeping them engaged on the service? What are, what are you doing to make sure they don't just get the subscription, but you're actually staying them, keeping them using the service? It's all about you know, suggesting the right piece of content uh, to people and, uh, and making sure that we, we understand well the, uh, the customer. So if you look at Netflix, we are, you can set up different profiles. Uh, it's actually up to five different profiles. You can have one profile for every member of the family, and even, even a kid's profile. So as I said, being very targeted is very important. So for example, we have a very strong uh, kids offering, and uh, that keeps improving over time. So it's really about the recommendation engine and making sure that we, uh, we keep bringing the right content. So obviously Netflix, <clears throat> as it grew a subscriber base, has become a bit of a challenger to the traditional cable network systems. <clears throat> so just turning to, to Rohit, Obviously, as Fox is the largest cable networks group across Asia, um, you've been experimenting with various types of streaming services across the markets, um, sometimes with the MVPD, the multiple video program distributors, sometimes directly. So what, is, what have you learned and what is some of your strategies to continue to build audience using video streaming as part of your, your, your business? So Rob, if you take a step back, I think one of the things, that, there are three things that we've looked at. Right? One is in terms of what our audience we want to go after. 
thus far, and I think let's start talking more about Asia X India, what we've taken a view is that we want to go uh, try to target consumers who have the willingness to pay for content and have the ability to pay for content. That's the first thing. The second is storytelling that resonates. And we operate, right, from you know, Chinese movies categories where we're producing shows with uh, the likes of Andy Lau to sports, to documentaries, to Hollywood movies and the like. So that storytelling has to be a core of what you do. If you don't have the right stories and you have the right recommendation engine, it's still not going to really work. And we've, we're a big believer in brands, right? Now, we have brands like National Geographic, which even on a social footprint have more than 400 million fans. Now, in terms of streaming services, we've sort of, going back to the way we've approached our markets, where we've always said, you know, no one gives you a passport which says Asia or Southeast Asia. So it has to be very different and tailored. So we've done a variety of things and also to build our capabilities. So starting off down, um, down under in Australia, last year we launched the first National Geographic app in the world, an integrated app where you have 65,000 photographs, uh, short form video, magazine articles, and long form. Learned a lot from that in terms of the consumption behavior and what we find, not surprisingly, the time spent is very different from what you have on a streaming service like a Fox Plus or, an, or a Netflix. The average time spent per session is seven minutes only, but people are going through photographs. So that's fantastic, and it's a very mobile first, mobile uh, uh, centric consumption. Coming to a Fox Plus, where we've sort of launched uh, most advanced market is the Philippines. What we are learning is that if you have some great content which re has resonated well on uh, uh, linear television, whether it's The Walking Dead or a great some of the great mo uh, big blockbuster movies and even live sport, you de do see some of the same uh, assumptions. We're I think the way what we're realizing is that uh, the media product of today is. Is, does have content as a very big pillar, but also has UI and the tech platform as a big pillar. So we are kind of co constantly working with colleagues across the broader Fox group, even our colleagues in India from Hotstar, to see what we can learn. And in Japan, we've done something different. We worked with the streaming players out there. 25% of our consumption of our, of our products come on streaming services. In China, we're part working with Tencent. Where we've got, uh, we launched a show f a month ago, which has right now 170 million views. So it's a whole different, you know, different types of things we've uh, we've done across markets and across genres to try and see how we can, you know, create a place for ourselves as this ecosystem is evolving. So just. Turning to Sora, so Facebook traditionally grew out of a community, a kind of a communication platform. Video has been available on the platform for a while, but you've just announced uh, you're, you're rolling out Facebook Watch globally. How is that different from what's already available, and, and what is your approach to building an audience and using that video streaming sort of service to actually drive the wider Facebook ecos ecosystem? Uh, yeah. So. Uh the thing is that we aren't a steaming service. <laughs> uh, we, we, we are a social network. And we started out being you know, a friends and family network. And that literally comes first. And we still uh, are very, very close to our DNA and our, our mission on that, uh, on connecting, connecting people across the world. However, you know, over a period of time, we've seen uh, various like, behaviors on the platform. So obviously, there's like news feed where uh, it's it, it's a it's a surface where people go and kind of consume quick quick content and it's like a little more snacky and uh, uh, you you have a little bit of time and you go there and see what your friends and family are doing, uh, but there is always a need to have a surface where uh, you would have an intent led behavior and you would go and uh, like want to spend a little more time and uh, productive time and so that's our new surface watch so what we've done is inside the facebook app uh, maybe it's rolled out completely we just announced uh, uh, last week or week before and everyone must must be having in their app so inside the facebook app you will see a tab which is uh, almost designed like a tv screen and uh, you can go there and watch a little more uh, it's it's completely videos and you can watch a little more like longish videos and uh, intent led videos and so um, i mean the whole thing is around um, connecting people through videos and how you can do meaningful social connections through uh, through some of these uh, some of these properties and Joey was on stage before this he spoke about La Liga and how sports kind of bring people together on the platform 
uh, where you you create almost like an experience when you are in the bar and you know you don't even know like people around you you're, but you're cheering and supporting uh, a team and you're li literally coming together so i think when we speak about like uh, or think about videos we we want like videos to connect the world or you know bring bring people closer together and that's the strategy around uh, around this and not, uh, and so it's not like literally streaming but it's uh, uh, it's somewhere somewhere in between i guess so that so there's still the content, but the content's in context as with the community that you're you're already connected to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So just turning to Ryan, um, when we first had our chat about this this panel, I was saying I, I was admitting my ignorance about quite how many things that Twitter is doing on on video, um, and you've just announced a deal, more than 50 deals. Just to really drum that point home with me, and thank you for the for supporting the, the pavilion as well. But. But why don't you help us understand a little bit more about what are you particularly looking for in your video streaming? What's the difference for the Twitter service compared with other platforms, social platforms, or other streaming services? What's, what's your approach that's different? Yeah, so um, if you think about the folks out here that have Twitter on their phone, the, the reason that you have Twitter on your phone, the one thing that we do best is we help you find out information about the things that you're most passionate about very quickly. Put it another way we help find out what's happening in your world. So I'd say very distinctly different than Facebook. Um, we don't think of ourselves as a social network. We think of Twitter as an information or as an interest network. So anything that we can do to help people find out what's happening in their world more quickly is going to result in user growth. Um, and I think we've seen that video is a, is a great format to deliver that really quickly. So the thing that we do, one of the nice benefits when you think about the types of content we go after is people have referred to Twitter as the world's largest sort of public library of human thought. The benefit of that being any tweet you send or you send is 100% public. So if we say what type of content should we acquire, and we announced, as you said, 50 deals here last night in this room, is we can say in Indonesia, what are the five things that people are talking about right now? So put it differently, we, we don't have to guess about the content we're going after, we're listening to that. So we take those signals and generally, the types of content that helps people find out what's happening in their world is sports, news, entertainment, and lifestyle. So the types of content we'll go after and is help people find out what's happening in their world, live, real-time information around that. So many of the products that you all are deploying in the markets across Asia were developed originally in the US. And obviously, there are certain global common trends that are uh, consistent everywhere. But also, the markets of Asia have developed in a different pace. The use of mobile, the data speeds, um, you know, the availability of data in a consistent way may be different than some of the markets the products were originally developed. What are you doing to create a user experience, or, or how have you adapted your user experience to, to keep it the most engaging way while staying consistent with, your, with some of your products? So maybe I'll, I'll throw it back to Tony because you know Netflix obviously. No, it, it's, a, it's a very good point because uh, Netflix has been operating in this part of the world for two years and a half now, and uh, the first years, uh, I mean the first two years were really about learning. So we essentially launched the, exactly the same product as we had in the U.S. and we did it on unproposed, but really to uh, to learn about the, the customer behavior, what kind of content the people like. Uh, we see 2018 as the, uh, the year of acceleration, where we're basically going to uh, significantly invest on uh, content, marketing, product, and, uh, and partnership. Um, if you look at this part of the world, we are in a very different paradigm. Um, for example, you know, the, this market is mainly prepaid. You know, people are paying you know, uh, you know, their phone uh, bill at the beginning of the month, right? which is very different from uh, some of the developed market, which is mainly postpaid. Uh, to your point, you know, the, uh, the infrastructure is a big issue in this part of the world. Uh, connectivity, so how do, we deal, uh, do, how do we deal with that? Method of payment is also, uh, it's, uh, it's also a problem and that we need to address being you know, a subscription uh, service. And we mainly rely on credit cards uh, in, uh, in Europe or in, uh, or in the US. So how do we do it in, uh, in, uh, in this part of the, the world? Another point as well is uh, how people consume content. Um, in the US or in, the, in Europe, it's mainly big screen uh, driven. While in, uh, in Asia, it's mainly, it's mainly on mobile. The way we basically try to address um, this different paradigm is really you know, through partnerships. Uh, we have partnership in our DNA. So we work with uh, operators 
all across the region, including you know, Globe in the Philippines, uh, Singtel in Singapore, and LGU Plus in, uh, in Korea. And the reason why we work with them is because they know the market better than anyone else. And they give us the opportunity to really you know, address those specificities in those markets. One good example is, uh, is on payment. We work with them on, uh, on carrier billing, so people can basically be charged on their, on, on their phone bill as opposed to your, use their uh, credit card. We work with them on uh, helping on the, the connectivity. Uh, we have our own content delivery network called Open to Connect, and we interconnect with operators in the, in the region, and we also put you know, caching server closer to the customer to make sure that we provide you know, the uh, the best possible experience uh, when it comes to streaming. Mobile as well. I mean, uh, we, launch, uh, we launch offline download uh, because in this part of the world, the connectivity is, um, is a bit patchy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we give people the opportunity to go on Wi-Fi, download all the series they want to watch. And, uh, and we also have a smart functionalities as well so that automatically we can go download the, the next episode. What we see is interesting is because in this part of the world, specifically in Southeast Asia and India, this is where we see most of the usage of this, uh, this functionality. Same thing in terms of encoding as well. Um, given you know, the, um, the, the, the data and the cost of data uh, in, uh, in Asia, we, we try to make sure that we do a better job in terms of encoding. So now with two gigabytes of data, we, you can stream 25, 25 hours of Netflix. And that is getting better and better over time. Uh, Rob, just to add to that, to Tony's point, I think one more thing that you have to do in uh, these markets is, uh, while we're solving for the data problem, we also have to recognize that a lot of these markets are very Android-driven, whereas a lot of Western markets are iOS. And in that, in the, uh, with that, uh, following from that, the number of devices, especially mobile devices, that you have to create, make sure that your app or service works well on and loads quickly and plays well on is a lot more. So that adds to the amount of work that you've got to do to fully scale out and be able to be present in a, for, uh, in a, in a scale manner in a particular market. Sorry, we heard from um, Ernest from Globe earlier in the morning that you know, he worked with you to pioneer a, uh, a kind of Facebook Lite that helped you manage your data very carefully. Now you're going to be putting a lot more video on the service. What are you doing to work with telcos or other partners to be able to still maintain the expected quality of service across Facebook, including the video streaming? I mean, look, the thing is that uh, across the world, we have about more than 2 billion people using the service for, per, per month. And more than 2 thirds of that is actually outside of US. Uh, and so uh, we are a global company. It's like no more, no more just thinking US or US first. Uh, a lot of our products actually uh, started off uh, in this part of the world. So example, we have this product called Instant Articles. So there's this typical problem of when you click an article, it takes like a whole uh, bunch of time to load and all of that. And we actually launched the Android version in India first, first ever launch. Uh, uh, the head of Globe is here. We, we launched our free basic service uh, from Philippines with them, uh, which is like super successful in many countries. There's like ex experiments on uh, WhatsApp payments here. So, and there's been a lot of learning as well. Like, you know, Indonesia, Thailand taught us uh, things like marketplace and small businesses doing, uh, doing transactions. And then we rolled it out globally. So, uh, there's a whole bunch of things which are happening in this region. And uh, we continuously continue to experiment in this region. So, we know the audience matters, but actually, content really, really matters. That's one of the things that seems to be consistent despite the rollout of technology. So, turning our attention now to content and content strategies, maybe I'll start with, with Ryan first. You know, what is your overall content strategy? You've announced a lot of content deals, but what's the overall strategy? How do you source content, particularly, for example, global deal, content deals, local, regional, what, what are you looking for, but how are you sourcing the content that's gonna drive your particular service? Yeah, so I think th this space has been probably one of the fastest developing areas of Twitter in terms of the folks that we hire, the teams we hire, so this region in particular is enormously fast growing for us. It's one of the fastest growing regions overall for Twitter. It has some of our biggest markets in Japan and India and Indonesia. Um, and I think content's playing a really big role in it. So a few sort of ways that we think about it. One is we are, we're not building your platform, right? We're not building 
a Netflix where you're going to tune in to a hour long sitcom at any point in the day because that doesn't really speak to that value proposition which is help me find out what's happening in my world right now. So our content strategy is very much driven by the user strategy which is can you help somebody find out more information immediately with that thing they're most passionate about. Um, so that's the sort of ethos to it. Uh, it will naturally take a place of most of the consumption will happen in the timeline itself and that timeline will be personalized. So if you are very much into politics in India, for example, we announced a huge deal uh, with Network 18 last night. So you'd be able to tune in to CNN in India and see all the content there. If you are a huge fan of the World Cup, your timeline will basically transform. You'll be seeing all of the highlights from the World Cup brought to you by Fox, et cetera. So I'd say in terms of the overall strategy, it's going to be a place where we deliver real-time content from partners that make sense, generally around news, sports, and entertainment. Um, and again, the data that we're going to use to drive what we go after is going to come after the, it's going to come from and be surfaced by the public tweets and the information that we have within the markets that we go after. So similar question, but turning actually to, to Rohit. So off the panel, you're the one that started with the largest content portfolio across many of those areas, sports and entertainment and factual. So how are you approaching content strategies for your streaming services? Are you just starting with the library, or are you creating customized content for the streaming services? What's your, what's your current approach or, or thinking? So we create a, uh, a plethora of uh, original content. If you look at TV shows, I mean, we've been uh, uh, winning Emmy Awards for since the time the Emmy started, and on the movie side as well. So I think very much the focus on just let's create the best possible content that we can create. And I think it depends. it's a market by market thing where you may choose a tactically or a, a long-term strategic play to put content first on the, in, in the streaming service, right? And then put it on some of your other mediums or do it all together at the same time. So that's where, you know, if you're looking at the streaming services like we have for Fox Plus, which are a subscription-driven service, that's there. Then on top of that, there's a whole additional uh, layer of opportunities which we now see is you know, working with uh, uh, working with partners to create content that drives the drives the impact of a particular uh, a, a, a particular event. So it could be for the Australian Open. We look at something like a Twitter and say, okay, how can we amp how can we really grow what we what uh, uh, the property by working with others. So that also means that we need to go beyond what we've been doing so far. And even when it comes to short form, and there's different types of short form that can work on different medium. So I think what's happening is we're using this content creation DNA that we you know our origins. Uh, we're able to look and more closely and what we can drive for each different area where we where we operate. All right, and I think in all of this, we place a lot of emphasis on curation. We don't, you know, we're not. Uh, underestimating the power of the recommendation engines. I think we're going to, we're, we're sort of saying, look, we've been here for 20 years. We have a lot of domain expertise, muscle memory. We know what works in certain markets beyond what, you know, beyond the data. Let's see how we can use all of that to create the best possible services that we can in whatever way we, we do it and whatever partnerships we strike. So just turning to Tony, obviously Netflix's roots came taking pre-produced content and distributing it and then a lot of license deals of established sort of programming. But you know, over the years, the, the budgets have grown massively. Um, and there's perhaps the most exciting is to push into original, uh, uh, originals, Netflix originals, commissioning original productions around the globe and delivering some great um, creative accolades you know, in recent years. But what is your approach to particularly the shift towards originals and commissioning? And what are you looking for that's going to help drive the whole of your platform? No, you're absolutely right. We started, you know, as essentially, you know, licensing existing uh, content. And uh, uh, 2013 was really the tipping point for us when we uh, decided to um, to launch House of Cards. And House of Cards was really, you know, the first of many original content. We started, you know, with uh, with, with series and dram drama, but now we do. Uh, original documentaries, original movies with Bright, uh, which is a movie with um, with Will Smith, uh, with your uh, original kids content as well. So now we see, you know, the the share of content being produced uh, by ne by Netflix increasing. Um, if I have to simplify things, you know, Netflix is at the same time a service, a subscription video on demand platform, and a studio. So we are truly vertically integrated. 
Uh, last year, we invested six billion uh, dollars in, in content. We increase to eight billion dollars uh, this this year, and it's uh, largely driven, you know, by our international, original, and international uh, licensing uh, efforts. Uh, so, for example, in Asia, we multiply by four uh, our libraries in 2016, and we have, I think, you know, around 15 uh, ongoing production in uh, in Asia, where I think, you know. Um, we, uh, we bring a lot of value being a, a global platform is the fact that you know great stories can come from everywhere um, for example Narcos is a show produced you know by a French production company uh, in in Colombia you know 75% in Spanish the rest in English but a, a number one show in a number of countries in uh, in, in Asia Another example is 3%, which is a show from uh, Brazil, with 50% of the audience coming from outside of uh, Brazil. So now we are investing in, uh, in shows like, you know, in, in India, for example, we release our first original Sacred Games. And um, we see not only an audience in, in India, but also uh, uh, all around the world. And we hope that will continue uh, from other countries in Asia, including, you know, Korea. Uh, we are going to release a slate of uh, original in Korea, and uh, we uh, we hope the audience, you know, will come not only from Korea but all across Asia may, and maybe Europe. So I just want to compare and contrast. So turning to Sorab, you know, um, the obvious thing is like, well, Netflix is spending 10 billion, 12, 15, 20. It'll just keep growing, I'm sure, um, on on original commissioning. And you're entering the Facebook watch space, so the usual question is, you know, well, how much are you going to spend and what are you commissioning? But you mentioned content's being created in context. What is your content strategy? And also, particularly, how are you working with creator ecosystems? So, because it is a platform, what are you doing to try and not only identify, but work with the, with the content creators to be able to create your content strategy? Yeah. Uh, I want to start off with... Uh a very interesting tweet. So there are these posters outside. There's one there, and then there are lots of them. Uh, and one says that uh, the entire world was like rooting for one football team, uh, which was actually the Thai rescue. Uh, and if if people know, it's literally like the Navy SEALs were streaming the whole like rescue of uh, those kids on on Facebook. And we had about five uh, 750k concurrent viewers watching it. Uh, now. If you look at you know like what content is it? Uh, <laughs> it's like, uh, but it's it's something which like creates hope and it's something which connects the world. Uh, and irrespective of wherever wherever you were, you were actually connected to that content. Uh, and you know in this panel we have like Fox and uh, Tony spoke about I I won't I won't I won't try your surname. Uh, Tony spoke about uh, a lot of shows uh, they are creating. But, uh, but the thing is, it's an ecosystem, right? I mean, a lot of what is happening here is actually also uh, being spoken about. And you know, there's a whole chatter on, on Facebook uh, and, and even on Twitter around some of those things. And so it's pretty interesting. Uh, it's, uh, I, I kind of, we, we kind of look at this as a, as a big ecosystem. Uh, and anything which, anything which can bring like, the world closer together, communities closer to you know, their interest is what it was excite us as a uh, as as kind of a video strategy, and uh, mind you, I mean videos can be very very passive, and so uh, it's it's not we 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 want to stick to our mission of literally uh, having having a experience where you are actually connecting to your friends and family, and so uh, for doing that, um, I mean you you kind of build tools around how people can watch video in a very different experience, and so example. Uh, just watching a sport match for hours and hours live is not not something we think is like super uh, like super valuable to us. But watching a sports match uh, and being able to like connect with friends and family and actually chatting and sharing and uh, having a very engaged viewership on the platform is something which is very very valuable. And that's why we create all these tools like. Uh, you're able to create a watch party, or you're able to do some like live with to call someone into your live and all of that, and that's very meaningful to actually uh, to actually be true to our mission. So it's a very different kind of way. It's not creating like a repository of video uh, library, but it's uh, it's something where you where people can connect. 
So given that the way the video is being cons consumed is evolving, traditional media used to look in terms of half hour shows or 22 minutes if you allow time for the breaks. Um, now people are consuming different lengths of time, different formats. So you know, how does format matter? How important is format now to consumption and to driving significant take up of your streaming services? That's an open question. Anybody have a strong thought about how important format is? I, I think you know, format doesn't really matter. Uh, it's really, you know, giving the power back to the, uh, the creator and giving them the opportunity to tell their, their stories, whatever is the format. So it's really up to them to es essentially choose the right format for their, their, their piece of content. Uh, so, you know, we have movies and we have um, series, but at, at the end of the day, in terms of the quality, it's very, very similar, right? Uh, some creator might, um, you know, decide to spend uh, maybe eight hours to tell a story, some other maybe, 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 you know, an hour. So it's really, you know, we don't have any um, limits, you know, like you can find, you know, with linear, linear TV, right? Uh, where you have to fit in those like uh, f slots, you know, 52 minutes documentary or half an hour, you know, sitcom. That you, you don't have that on Netflix. So it's a lot of, you know, uh, flexibility and freedom for the, for the creator. Okay, switching gears a little bit, but still on the content decision making. Data. There's a lot more data available. Data analytics is a very cool thing and get a lot of investment in that area. How important is the data analytics in your decision making as to what content you commission, how you program your services, how much is still human curation? I'll start with Tony because you were looking no, at of course, was, of course Netflix is known to use a lot of data uh, to make decisions. Uh, we do a lot of uh, A-B testing as well, you know, on, uh, on the product itself, on, uh, you know, what icon or thumbnails are better performing than the other. Uh, and in terms of piece of content, we definitely use data. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's an art as well. It's not only a science, it's an art. We have a, a team of um, very experienced people based in LA, you know, spending their, their days, you know, finding great piece of content. So, of course, we use data, but as well, you know, a team that have a great expertise. Mm. So, Rap, Facebook? Yeah, I mean, that's the primary thing, right? Because uh, we have real people on the platform, we have like logged in people, and so uh, there is much more accuracy in, in terms of uh, what data is available to, to partners. Uh, I mean, Netflix has a page on Facebook, which is almost like 50 million fans. Uh, and so like Fox has millions of fans and their pages and we have very deep analytics uh, on the platform where uh, you get like all sorts of uh, analysis and data to kind of see what's working or not and that's that's obviously like a primary thing. Will you help them with their content decision making then? Uh, they already do so uh, I mean so yes, you do. Uh, I said it's an ecosystem. Everyone uses each other to. to I, I mean, you have like Netflix has a 50 million, almost like 40 to 50 million fan base. So there's a lot of data uh, available for them on Facebook as to what their sh people are talking about their shows or what the chatter is and everything. Uh, you know, I think uh, there's always been data. There was TV ratings data to start with, and now the fact that we have, you know, on a personalized basis consumption data, different other other cohorts that you can create is amazing, right? And I do think, like Tony said, you know, it's art and science combined. But it all, what it also does, and it, which is important, it enables us to tailor make not just our, the programming decisions, right? But also uh, the content, the cost of subscriber acquisition, retention, all of those metrics uh, can, be, can be developed much better with the amount of data that we're now able to get. So I think on the content selection side, I mean, there will be signal, there will still be a lot of the art of it involved. We can't take that away, and that's great. It should remain, I mean, I think it should remain that way. If everything can be predicted just by data, then it'll become too predictable. Brian, you were gonna add? Yeah, I, I just think from, a, from our point of view, it can be kind of hard to develop live content, right? To have content that is relevant in a specific moment. And if that's where we work, we work with partners to, deliver that type of content that's going to resonate when someone's looking for that fresh brand new thing, it can be a difficult thing to do. So I think from a data perspective, that's actually critical for us because our partners will come to us and say, tell us what's happening yesterday, today, and that'll actually start to inform the content that goes on air on Twitter. I'll give you an example. BuzzFeed uh, has a show called AM to DM. It's sort of a good morning America for millennials in the US. 
and it basically covers what is happening around the world as informed by the tweets that are happening on Twitter. So I think data plays a huge part into actually informing content strategy for our partners. And then from a discovery perspective, since we're not building a destination like a Netflix for people to come and sift through that content, it is critical that we use data to deliver content in a unique way. So we just launched something at the top of the phone. It's called uh, the What's Happening module. So my What's Happening module will look very much different than yours based on our interests. You'll scroll through it and you'll be able to sort of tune into different content around there. So data, I think, is critical for us to help our partners build the right content that's going to be live and relevant in the moment, and then critical for us to help people actually discover the right content within our platform. So staying on data but switching to business models. So actually, I mean, stay with you, Ryan. So, you know, the data, the insights you get, how is that helping you drive conversations with your advertising partners? Um, and particularly, how's video going, to, video going to be different than the rest of the service? How is you going to deepen your relationship with advertisers? Yes, look, there's a few things. One, we all know that video is one of the slash the fastest growing sources of advertising budgets. So clients and their budgets are focused towards this. So we're obviously pivoting towards that. Um, I think when advertisers come to Twitter, the primary reason they come is for the distinct audience and the way they use the platform. So if you're going to come and reach somebody who's hungrily refreshing a timeline to find new information about, that, about the World Cup, that's really interesting if you're Coca-Cola or Adidas and are a sponsor of the World Cup. So the more that we can actually find that data to inform, hey, Coca-Cola, this is the time and the place that you should be inserting your message in front of that audience. Uh, that's what drives the decision making on their part. So I think our being able to say this is going to resonate with Coca-Cola because this is where your audience is most passionate is how they drive a lot of the decisions about what types of video investment they make with us. And sorry, I've just on from a Facebook perspective, similar kind of question, but also how are you using that to build trust with brands as more and more brands don't just rely on a basic um, inventory buy, but they rely on storytelling and they rely on relationships with the consumers you know, with, for, for their brands. How are, you, how are you using your video streaming services to deliver some of that? Yeah, I mean, look, the thing is, uh, for us, it's a bit different because uh, we, we do not, like, our sales model or ad model doesn't work on uh, the base, basis of content, but it works on basis of interest of people. And it's very different, like, way of selling. Uh, and it could be very valuable or meaningful uh, if you if you're able to give like specific uh, cuts in that or specific filters. Uh, having a having a service which is like real people logged in uh, and having real friends uh, and, and actually real interests. Uh, it's it's obviously you know it's it's actually actual data. It's not like cookie based or anything else. And uh, so like brands find it really valuable. Uh, to to advertise on Facebook, Rohit, you had a blended model. You had some subscription revenue coming from you know the, yep. your subscription partners, and you have advertising. As you move over to more streaming services, how do you see that evolving, changing? Are you continue with blend, or is it going to lean towards one or the other? I think uh, it'll continue to be a blend. And I think from a, from our perspective, what you offer we offer is uh, the level of engagement. Because if you think about it, the metrics for counting an, counting an ad as viewed on TV is minimum of 15 seconds. Right? So that is a strength which TV has where it guarantees you a very high level of engagement. Now, as the, the amount of data that we can pull through improves, you'll be able to create a model which offers a, blend, uh, a blended cost per view across linear and digital and allows you to then create, you know, uh, put a premium on certain types of content which are driver content which have a higher uh, uh, engagement level. The other thing for us I think will remain is the whole point about brands with purpose. When, so when people partner with, uh, with advertisers and brands uh, partner with us on National Geographic, they're partnering a lot with the purpose of the brand, whether it's a planet or plastic initiative that we have or whether it's oceans. And then you know, there is an element of that as well. So I think, sure, you know, the data part of it will, will, uh, will play, will provide new opportunities and also make, them, make things more, a lot more competitive, right, as we're seeing. But some of these, these aspects of uh, being able to associate with certain types of brands and the value that that brings will continue. And Tony, I'm not going to ask you about advertising because the recent test for promos that got mistaken for advertising seemed to get a, a bit too much attention. But um, 
As you look to your business model, many of the markets, are, the future projections of OTT streaming revenue in Asia, a large percentage of that is advertising because of income levels and, and various other challenges in rolling out services in Asia. Um, how are you responding to billing, pricing kind of challenges as you move into this next wave of growth for, for Netflix across, across the Asia region? I mean, we're, you're absolutely right. We are like a one product company. So we have a very, uh, very simple business model. It's all about uh, subscription. So it's easy to understand for the, uh, for the customer. And uh, we have absolutely no, no advertising on service. So the service is uh, very, very clean. Um, that being said, we are currently you know, experimenting different kind of uh, model. Uh, we are doing uh, bundling in uh, in the U.S. You know, with uh, with Comcast, and that's something that we are looking to uh, you know expand in uh, in uh, in more countries. Uh, for example, we uh, we launched a bundle uh, in Japan with uh, with KDDI, where basically you know Netflix is uh, is in, in included in your in your plan. Uh, so that is definitely you know a model we are uh, exploring and that we are planning to uh, pl planning to scale in the, in the future. Um, Another thing that we are currently doing is, if you look at the, the, the cost of Netflix, it's actually you know, the, the, the price for the subscription that you pay, but also, also the cost of data. Uh, and of course, you know, in, in most of the market in, uh, in Asia, data is quite, uh, quite expensive. So we work very closely uh, with some of the operators to participate in some of their video data plans so that it can make you know, the cost of Netflix uh, way more uh, more affordable than it is today. So a lot of you have mentioned the words partner and ecosystem, and it seems you know the industry has evolved from a value chain that starts one end and passes the ball down to a connected kind of ecosystem. I just want to ask one of the questions. One of the key gatekeepers, it seems, in this part of the world, that are both a partner and potentially a gatekeeper, are the telcos. So how do you see the role of the telcos? How do you? most effectively work with telcos to be able to enable the consumer to effect, you know, essentially receive your service in the best and easiest possible way. I mean, run down the line. So Ryan, I might start with you. Yeah, I think um, it, it's, it's predominantly, a, it's a focus in areas like developing countries, right? Where, where broadband costs, or excuse me, where mobile costs are incredibly high. I think the interesting thing we found is that even in markets where data costs are incredibly high, we've, we've developed Twitter Lite, and we actually we acquired a company called Magic Pony, which actually helps take low rendering video and through machine learning, it actually hones in on where the action is happening and puts it into high def. So we're working on different ways to display video in markets where that data cost is expensive. But even in markets where it is, like across Southeast Asia, the growth in video consumption is, is astonishing. We're talking over 100% year on year growth in that. So um, I think we'll continue to work with them to figure out what's the right way to provide content on people's phones, but it's interesting to see that that's not especially slowing down the growth that we're seeing in these markets. Tony? I mean, partnering with Telco is, of course, you know, very important, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier, because we can work together, you know, on co-marketing. We uh, definitely work together on, on, on distribution. But if you look at um, emerging Asia overall, um, phones are actually sold on the open market. So it's not only uh, partnering with the telcos, but it's also very important for us in terms of getting distribution to partner with the smartphone uh, manufacturer. So on that note, we, uh, we partner with Xiaomi and uh, Huawei um, uh, in, uh, in uh, India and uh, a few other markets to essentially distribute uh, the Netflix app in, uh, in the phone, you know, preloaded. Pre so uh, the partnership ecosystem for us is not only limited to the, to the telco, um, we also partner with uh, different kind of stakeholders, including the smart TV manufacturers, the smartphone manufacturers, and so on and so forth. All right. I think one of the lessons we've learned, and we've, we've partnerships across uh, all markets in Asia, is, this, is the importance of aligning on objectives. So if I'm a, premium, I'm a subscription service, right? I'm priced at $5 in the, the Philippines, and I, you know, you need to align with your partners in terms of what is the addressable market you're going after. And that alignment is key. Because if you're, say, in, the, in Indonesia, you have someone who has 170 uh, mobile subscribers, most of them, 95% of them are $1 ARPU. And they want to grow video to those 160 million, uh, million um, subscribers, then your product may not be the right partnership for them to do that objective. So I think a lot of times with the uh, 
uh, the primary goals are misaligned, which create a challenge. If we're, able, if we're moving to a, or more, working very hard to make sure that we align on the goals, right? And then, I, you know, it's about, it's about being able to do, you know, from the product side, making sure the product works in low bandwidth, different types of phones, uh, put together data packages, also give people an opportunity to try the product for a longer period which is one of the things that we've been working with the, with the telcos for. And, and on the, uh, not just on the mobile side, but on the broadband side. Getting people to actually download the app. I think going much deeper, and we've done this a lot with you know, Ernest and his team in, in, in the Philippines for sure, uh, uh, very well, where we've, made, we've gone to people's, uh, while the uh, uh, person is installing the broadband at home, right? It lets the customer know, saying, hey, by the way, you know, you have a Fox Plus and a Netflix available for X, this thing. Would you like me to set it up for you? So it's going really deep to make sure that we can actually drive the consumption. Otherwise, if we leave it to each other, the telco and us to say, oh, you know, I give you the product, you just sell it through your network, will not work. Or the other way around, you just give it to me, and I'll give it to everyone for free. That also does not work. In our case, it may be different for others, but you know, it's kind of there's a lot of work and a lot of detail involved with these partnerships, and they're they're proving. And though, if you can manage those well, there's real benefits to be had at the end of it. So, yep. Yeah, I mean, look, the I think the answer is universal, right? I mean, everything what Ryan, Tony, and Rohit said, it's pretty uniform. Tel like telcos are super important, uh, but the other so so I agree with that. But the other thing is also like making making the services efficient. So we focus a lot on uh, how does like the loading time is, or uh, how how heavy the app is, and all of that. And uh, again, I mean Facebook Lite app, which is a separate version but a much lighter version for some of the countries here, uh, is doing also phenomenally well. And then we also announced our first data center in Asia in Singapore last week. Uh, so I mean some of those things are also very critical to have a, have an efficient service. But obviously telcos are super important uh, for everyone. So one last question for each of you. Um, the start I mentioned there are 224 streaming services at last count. Um, what is your advice to those other 220 as they look to, to growing their streaming services? So I'll start with Ryan, so you've got time to think about it. Sorry. <laughs> what advice would you give to one of those other streaming services? Not the ones on the stage. Yeah, we, we talked about this really in prep. I mean, there's, I think there's a lot of focus on, on size. We have an enormous audience and we have billions of streams and I think this, the size of an audience is getting relatively commoditized. We have partners on here who reach everyone in the world, right? So I, I think the advice to anyone who has one of these services is um, it's something that we are trying to take to heart, which is focus on the audience. So what is it you know about your audience? What is unique? How is that a value proposition to publishers who are gonna develop content for your platform and for advertisers that wanna connect with those consumers? So, Focus on the audience is our is recommendation from us. Great. Uh, from my side, I would say uh, focusing definitely on the customer and the product, um, but also very more importantly in uh, educating customers in Asia on the value of uh, paying for entertainment. Uh, because if you look at you know the biggest competitor of all the services is definitely free uh, or piracy. And um, in this part of the world, you know, Paris is to the roof. And uh, making sure that the, the entire industry and all those streaming services, including ourselves, are doing a great job building very relevant uh, products for customers will definitely help, you know, educating uh, customers on the value for paying for entertainment. So I would say focus on building value rather than trying to build a valuation. Uh, we have too many services trying to build valuation and not focusing on the things that uh, Tony and Ryan spoke about. I mean, very quickly for us, it's all about community, and I think that's pretty close to our hearts, our mission. And so, I would say to everyone, I, I mean, try to build communities uh, on 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 the back of back of good content. Well, look, um, one thing that's really clear from the panel is that it's full um, full stream ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the development of the streaming services. Um, and what is really interesting about this new eco ecosystem is it is an ecosystem that while in, through one lens you compete, through the other lens you're all partnering with each other to grow the overall ecosystem. And I think that pro pro provides a lot of opportunities for yourselves and the rest of the ecosystem. And actually is a, um, a growth opportunity, not just a challenge. So please join me in thanking the panel, Ryan, Tony, Rohit, and Saurabh. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.